Hi Facebook, how are you tonight? Um, I'm going to turn on Instagram too, usually I do you guys first, but... Hi Instagram, you are here with me, Brittany Bowles, and also the people over in Facebook land uh, to hear the next chapter of my book, Finding Starlight. This chapter is called Bricks in the Wall, and for those of you who are just starting to follow along, um, Finding Starlight is the true story of my life as told through the lens of a past life regression session that really happened. It is sometimes a triggering book, um, so be aware of that, and some names have been changed for various reasons. Uh, you can catch up on prior chapters on my website, which is BrittanyBowles.com. And this book is not published anywhere right now. I am still seeking agency representation um, or just plain to be discovered the good old fashioned way by Reese Witherspoon or Ellen DeGeneres, um, both who are really great at elevating women and their careers and their stories. So that's enough chatter from me. We'll get started right away now with chapter 15 of my book, Finding Starlight. This chapter is called Bricks in the Wall. I stood, stretched, and needed another drink from the pool. This water is delicious, I told Katrina, who was exercising her wings in flight around the clearing. It's the perfect temperature. It tastes like pine and cilantro, or maybe like fresh snow and summer rain. I can't quite figure it out, but it's amazing. You should like it, she said. It's perfect after all. I smiled at her response, not entirely sure what she meant, but glad that she said it. I've always loved this place, I admitted, though I must say it's never felt quite so alive as it does now. Ever since I was a child, I've come here. We all have a sacred space inside of us, she said, settling back onto her perch. And in each sacred space is a wellspring perfectly suited to energize, heal, and nourish us. We carry within our hearts the fountain of youth and everything we could ever need to thrive. That's an interesting thought, I replied, returning to the spongy earth across from her for someone who came here with a tale of a shadowed heart haunted by darkness. Ah, yes, that shadowed heart, as you say. Shall we look into that and see what is meant to be shown? She asked. I think I'm ready, I answered. Do you want me to tell you what I think about it or how I understand it to exist before our little cloud here gets too excited? I had to laugh at the eager fluff ball already hovering between us. Sure, give me the summary. She smiled at the cloud too. It was obviously eager to participate. I somehow turned the memories of my traumatic experiences into shadow stones with each incident, like abuse or a time that my mom neglected me, whatever, I made a new stone. Eventually, there got to be so many stones that they surrounded my heart. You know the phrase, a wall around the heart? Or, she has a wall up? I asked. Yes, she answered. Well, let's just take that literally. I literally had a wall around my heart. Interesting, she said. To the cloud, now floating like a smooth pool of moonlight, she said. Okay, you're on. It was nighttime in my bedroom at Dad and Jane's house. I laid awake on the top bunk, staring at the ceiling. Amber slept soundly on the bottom bed. I was replaying recent events in my mind. Gold light shone dim gold light shun shone dimly around me, illuminating sad brown eyes. My eyes acted like a projector 
showing memories as I thought them like holographs on the shadow in front of my face. That's how the cloud showed it happening, anyway. A memory appeared of a time my dad told me a woman would never be president. I sealed the scene inside of a cold, hard rock, turned it over in the air, breathed deeply, shrank it, and called it into my chest. We could see where the memories went, like the light around me was somehow making me less solid. I was also holographic in this way. Once the shadow stone made it past my skin, it settled into place with others that had already been laid. It seemed like the shadow bricks were forming a wall around a glowing golden orb in the center of the chest. We never fully got to see the orb since there were already so many stones in front of it, but it was definitely there. As more and more stones went down, golden light only shone through slits and gaps, like the tower was trying to hide a room full of sunshine. Cloud agrees with your summary, Katrina remarked. I'm starting to wonder why I keep insisting on telling you things, I grinned. There's power in the telling, Katrina said. You get to reframe your experience with your words. You decide what to keep and what to let go. Maybe, I replied. I still have nightmares about living in that house. Getting screamed at by dad or Jane, I said changing the subject. Only in the nightmares I'm yelling back, fighting for myself for a change. How does that feel? She asked. Not very good, actually. I end up throwing a tantrum while they stand there unaffected, mocking me. Usually, I wake up angry and frustrated. You felt powerless as a teenager, she said. Yeah, I did, I agreed. It was a difficult time. After becoming so independent and grown up when it was just mom, Amber, and me, I found it hard to assimilate into a family especially one that was so dysfunctional. I was used to problems being big, ugly, obvious monsters that I could fight or run away from. When we moved in with Jane, it was a totally new kind of warfare. The house itself was quaint, situated on the corner of Greystone Avenue in a middle-class suburb. It was yellow with green trim, a perfectly manicured lawn, and bright flowers. The inside was meticulous. Jane made us clean it every day. Our fights were mostly psychological, nearly silent one day and angry yelling the next. Dad was explosive. He flew into a rage at the littlest thing, predictably unpredictable. He terrorized both me and Jane, pitting us against each other. She deeply resented me. What were you like during this time? Were you angry? Did you do okay in school or were you struggling because the home life was so hard? Katrina seemed genuinely interested in my late teenage years, which was slightly frustrating as I had hoped to skip over them. I answered, it's tough for me to talk about. After mom died, until I moved out, so basically the whole time I was in high school, things were weird. It was almost like I was living a double life. Outside of my home, I was well-liked and charismatic. I played a positive role in my community, had good friends, and was known for being a genuinely good person. At home, it was the opposite. I was ripped apart for everything I said, did, or thought. Nobody liked me. It was suffocating. What made you genuinely a good person outside of your house? How did you manage to stay so positive? She persisted. I sighed. I guess we're going there. Okay, I said, let's see. Cloud obligingly and encouragingly readied itself. Strange little fluff, that cloud, I thought to myself, then began. I was very involved in my church. I taught Sunday school to the younger kids. 
The cloud was showing a brightly colored room in which I was presenting a cake to a bunch of five and six-year-olds. We sang happy birthday to Jesus and blew out the candles. I was crying with joy. It was Christmas. I was a very visible presence in my youth group, 180. We were a passionate bunch of teenagers, I explained as the cloud changed to an animated conversation between me and my peers. I started a Bible study at my school before hours at like six in the morning. We then saw an image of me walking a wooded path on the grounds of a monastery. We occasionally went on retreats, which of course my dad refused to pay for, so I often had to fundraise or receive anonymous donations. Those were amazing times being immersed in spirituality off in the woods. I convinced one or two of my non-church friends to come, and by the end of the weekend, they accepted Jesus. I had a heart for marginalized kids. My friends were wonderful, intelligent, and kind, but even they had judgments about what they considered weird or annoying people. I reached out to those weirdos and brought them into the fold. I found outcasts, smokers, kids whose history was just as jaded as mine, and I brought them into my heart, my life, my church. I really believe we changed each other's lives for the better. I'm incredibly grateful for the support system I had and my friends during those years. Honestly, I don't know what I would have done without them. Young me, laughing in the middle of a group hug, appeared on the cloud. Then we saw a scene in a stately and official courtroom. Me, dressed in a pencil skirt and suit jacket, giving an opening statement to a judge. At school, it was sort of the same thing. My freshman year was devoted to mock trial. We were a young team and a good one. We prepared court cases and competed for real judges in real courtrooms. I was the captain of the team and worked tirelessly. We went pretty far in our first year. Then I competed in speech team as an original orator, meaning that I wrote and performed my own competitive, persuasive speeches. Did your dad come to your competitions? Katrina interrupted. The cloud showed an audience of parents and siblings. The answer was obvious. I said, no, not to mock trial or speech. He never came to anything anymore once we moved in with Jane. Katrina kept her face clear of expression. I continued talking. I wrote for the school newspaper and helped out with the yearbook. My senior year, I became the editor of the Wolfpack Press. It was my prerogative to publish edgy, controversial pieces. <laughs> once I had a front page expose with photos of drugs at a party. Another time, I did an interview with students from a rival school who claimed that all Park High School girls were sluts. I wrote a feature article comparing different religions in our community, I said. Writing journalism was my passion. Well, <clears throat> in addition to spirituality, I guess. <clears throat> oh. Sorry. <clears throat> Writing journalism was my passion. Well, in addition to spirituality, I guess. Hard to say which came first. I smiled as the cloud showed my favorite teacher and journalism advisor, Mr. McCarthy. I recalled a memory of a hushed conversation he and I had once, which the cloud promptly picked up. Legally, you can write and publish anything you want, McCarthy was saying. I was sitting on top of his desk, listening raptly. He said, you know that, it's free speech. I nodded triumphantly. But, he said more seriously, I am in a union, and the principal is my boss. As you know, he reserves the right to review the whole paper before we go to print. He may decide to censor you. 
I scowled and began to interject, but he held up his hand and I shut my mouth. He had that effect on me. I respected him because he respected me too. You need to hear what I'm saying right now, Brittany. Listen closely. His voice was slow and firm. I was enraptured. If you get censored, I am legally bound to stand by my administration. There is nothing I can do. My hands are tied. I, for instance, can't call the local news. I, for instance, can't stage a walkout. I can't start a petition. These are all things that I, as your teacher, cannot do, he said with a gleam in his eye that always made me think of him as an otherworldly and mischievous creature. He looked, an <laughs> he looked a lot like an elf. We all knew it. I said, I get it. You can't do anything if the administration comes down on me, but I'm just a kid. Nobody can fire me. If I get censored, you better believe people are going to hear about it. He smiled. I had received his message loud and clear. He said, well, if that ever happens, I'm washing my hands of it and then dusted off his hands like, it wasn't me. The scene changed to an award ceremony. I was receiving a medal and McCarthy was in the front row clapping and whooping wildly. I explained to Katrina. Because of my work on the paper and all the boundary pushing I did, we were given a National First Amendment Award. It was a pretty prestigious, it was pretty prestigious and was all about honoring and exemplifying free speech in public school. Not many schools ever won. I think we were one of the only two that year. We flew to Atlanta to accept it. That was one of my proudest moments. Your dad and Jane must have been proud too, Katrina said like she was trying to convince herself. She knew the answer. No, I said flatly. All they did was fight with me about going, refuse to pay for anything, and then finally agree to let me go when someone else took care of the financials. I suspect McCarthy paid for it, but he said the district stepped in. I paused. These weren't easy times for them, though, in their defense, I said to be fair. Jane had five kids, I think I told you. Three grown boys, Brian, Sean, and Craig, and two teenage girls, Sarah and Heather. Heather was my age and in the same grade as me. We went to school together, obviously, and tried to be strangers while we were there. I was in all advanced classes and super involved in anything extracurricular that I could be. And she worked her ass off and got straight A's. I had Ivy League college, massive world change and a writing career on my mind. Heather's goals were what people would consider reasonable. Jane was constantly mad at me for not even trying while well, using Heather as, a, as the example of hard work and dedication. I didn't care. It wasn't a competition to me. I admired Heather. Brian and Sean, Jane's oldest boys, were drug addicts. It was bad. They were beyond the point of no return and it was tough to watch. I already said I'm not going to tell Jane's story because it's hers, not mine. But it's important for me that you know that she wasn't an evil person, despite how hard she was on me. Both of her older boys ended up dead. Can you imagine that? A mother burying two sons. My heart broke for her. We couldn't connect over it. I don't know why. We just never connected. Even when we were both grieving, because I loved Brian and Sean too, especially Sean. He was my friend. She was so mad at me. She said I was heartless and cold, that I didn't care. She yelled at me to get out of the house. Then she was furious that I went to school instead of staying home and grieving. I get it, she was a mess. How could she not be? And I 
deal with pain differently than she does or maybe differently than most people do. She still had kids to raise and dad was no help with any of it. She always sided with her own daughters over Amber and me. Dad's violence raged in all our directions, but Jane chose to shield her own girls as best she could, leaving me to protect Amber and take the brunt of the abuse myself. We all developed self-esteem issues. Jane would tell us, none of us are beauties in this house. We're all a little homely. Amber had it the worst. Jane tried to make her work out, stop eating snacks and sugar and all this stuff. She was just a little girl. It made me so angry. Heather and Sarah made fun of Amber all the time and there was nothing I could do to stop it. I guess I grew to hate Jane as much as she hated me. Even though I kept trying to redirect myself toward compassion, I stopped and shook my head to clear out the anger that was building up just talking about this. I had worked so hard for so long to let it go, but was obviously still affected. Around the time I turned 18, I started losing touch. I was working two jobs and had let the newspaper slide. New friends, partiers, were taking the place of my support network. I discovered that I loved smoking pot. It was the only thing that turned the constant screaming in my head into a sort of soft white noise in the back of my mind. The stress of home was eating me alive. I stopped going to church. My friends were hard on me. They said I was throwing my life away. The church leadership advised them to walk away from me because I was becoming a bad influence. Most of them did. They just turned their backs. At least that's how it felt to me. One night, I got drunk at the bowling alley with some of my new friends. I lost my virginity in the back seat of my car. It was not exactly consensual, yet again. That pretty much destroyed me. I felt worthless and had nowhere to turn because my old friends, the good ones, wanted nothing to do with me. My new friends were all having sex and being crazy, so they didn't get why I was so upset. My dad suspected something was going on. He and Jane <clears throat> both did. In their usual, totally psychotic way, they played mind games with me. Dad made me confess to something he knew but wouldn't say, and I told him everything. I told him about drinking, about drugs, about losing my virginity. He looked at me like I was dead to him. It the thing he knew and wouldn't say and was trying to get me to confess ended up being that I had slid down the driveway in the snow and hit Sarah's car. That's all he knew the whole time, even as he let me spill my guts about drinking, drugs, losing my virginity. I didn't even realize I damaged the goddamn car that day, but that was the last straw. I decided to leave. I was 18 years old, still in school, but legally an adult. Things had gotten out of control. I had spent years feeling like a prisoner. We all had, really. But I could not stand another argument, screaming or silent. The cloud was reanimated, ready to show another scene. I thought about what to say, but it jumped in without prompting to the day I left home. Dad was clutching a piece of paper in his fist, furious. We were having a standoff in his filthy, cluttered basement room. I stood in front of the TV, which was still on, but muted. What the fuck is this? He demanded quietly in his dangerous voice. 
I took a deep breath, steadying myself, and forced myself to look at him. It's a letter. Didn't you read it? He didn't answer, so I continued. I explained to you that I can't stay here anymore. Things are too bad between everyone. Your wife keeps threatening to leave you, saying that it's my fault because she can't stand to be around me. All we do is fight. Nobody is happy. If I leave, which I'm going to do, you guys might have a chance at figuring stuff out. I'm not helping anyone by staying here. And dad, I wrote in the letter, if you just read it, that this is not your fault, okay? It's not your fault. I love you. This is what's best for all of us. He seemed to struggle finding words and then spat. Fuck you. We had an agreement and you're breaking it. Fuck you. If you walk out that door, you're never coming back. Do you hear me? You are dead to me if you walk out that door and leave all your shit. Nothing is yours. Do you understand? Nothing. Get the fuck out of my room. But dad, I said, trying to hold my composure. I said, get the fuck out, he roared. The cloud shifted to another scene at night in what was once my bedroom. Amber was reading a book on her bed alone in the room. From outside, I tapped on the window and drew her attention. She closed the bedroom door before walking over and sliding open the screen. I stood outside in the grass. She leaned out, hugging me hard. Sis, I said urgently, I'm so glad you're alone. I need to hurry. We know what will happen if dad finds, if dad catches me. I'm glad you're here, she said, eyes bright under her long, straight, blonde hair. She looked so young, yet old beyond her years. Of course I'm here, I answered, choking. I will always be here for you, no matter what. She looked away. You said you needed some money, right? I asked, wanting to get her back. That would be really great, she admitted. My friends are going school clothes shopping and, well, you know, dad doesn't like to pay for new clothes. Where are you going? I asked. I wanted this moment to last forever, even though I knew it couldn't. To the mall she said. The Mall of America, of course. Okay, here's a couple hundred. Will that do it? I asked, handing her some folded bills. What? Sis, that's way too much, she said, pushing it back at me. It's fine. It's the only thing I can do for you. And that kills me. Please just take it. I want you to have a good time and get everything you want. I want you to know that I still love you and that I'm in your life, okay? A noise from the hallway made her jerk away. Okay, fine, I'll take it, she said in a quiet rush. You need to go before we get caught. I know, I replied, sad and angry. I'll check in with you soon, okay? I love you. I love you so much. And that concludes chapter 15 of my book, Finding Starlight, the true story of my ridiculous life. Chapter 16, which is called The Blair Witch, premieres next week early again because I'm traveling for work. Um, I haven't decided what day I'm going to do it yet. I think probably Monday uh, that video will come out. So thank you so much for watching. Um, again, you can find all of the previous videos, chapters 1 through 14, and later this one, up on my website, BrittanyBowles.com. This is an unpublished book. I am seeking agency representation. Uh, so 
thank you so much. Um, as always, please reach out to share your own story with me if you'd like. Uh, you can DM me, you can message me through my website, you can comment. Um, I would love to know who the hundreds of people who are watching this are, so like, react, comment. I would love you forever if you did that. Uh, anyway, thank you so much, and I will see you early next week with Chapter 16, The Blair Witch. Until then.